own. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in a series of lectures on race and the curriculum. I'm particularly delighted to welcome Sir Hilary Beckles, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, to launch this series. Sir Hilary is a distinguished economic historian and university administrator who was appointed Vice Chancellor just last year. He has experienced higher education as a student, a researcher, and a leader in two quite different contexts. He studied for his BA and PhD at the University of Hull before taking up an academic post at the University of the West Indies, where he's worked ever since. He was promoted to Professor of Economic and Social History in 1991 and has risen through the ranks of senior administrative roles since then. Outside the university, Sir Hilary is Vice President of the International Task Force for the UNESCO Slave Route Project, a consultant for the UNESCO Cities for Peace Global Program, an advisor to the UN World Culture Report, and a member of UN Secretary General's Science Advisory Board on Sustainable Development. He is editor of the UNESCO General History of Africa series and a keen cricket fan. He has received numerous awards in recognition of his major contribution to academic research into transatlantic slavery, popular culture, and sport. His recent work focuses on reparations and reparatory justice, which will be his subject this evening. He has also informed me that if anybody wants to know anything about the Irish in the Caribbean, he is our man. Um, while I uh, just learned that while I was an undergraduate in Trinity uh, College Dublin, Sir Hilary was doing research for his PhD on the Irish in the Caribbean in Trinity College Dublin. Um, but it's also a particular pleasure for me personally to welcome Sir Hilary as I feel a, a close bond to the University of the West Indies. And I visited the Trinidad campus just last year. Uh, just a few months ago, I welcomed Principal Sankat, principal of the Trinidad campus to Scotland. Uh, as many of you probably know, I was until recently the principal of the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. But you may not know that one of my predecessors as principal, uh, Professor Sir James Irving, chaired the Irving Commission, which established the University of the West Indies in, in 1948. So we've had some long-standing links uh, with the university. Uh, some of our um, peculiar traditions, these are not unique to Oxford, I should point out, ha have uh, carried across the Atlantic, so undergraduates have this option of wearing red gowns. We also have uh, research collaborations with the West Indies as well as dedicated scholarships. And in recognition of these links, I invited Sir Hilary's predecessor, Sir Nigel Harris, uh, to St. Andrews in 2013 when we celebrated our 600th anniversary. Um, he came and lectured on the future of universities and was awarded an honorary degree. So I'm personally absolutely delighted uh, to welcome Sir Hilary here. Um, now, as I mentioned, this lecture is the first in a series of guest lectures entitled Race and the Curriculum that will be delivered in the course of 2016. Uh, future lectures will be given by uh, Professor Homi Baba of Harvard and Professor uh, Ruth Simmons, formerly president of um, Brown University. Now, the aim of these lectures is to stimulate debate about the university's curriculum, what it teaches, and from what perspective it draws its scholarship. We want to ensure that our principle of equality of opportunity and the value we place on diversity in the selection of students and the appointment of staff informs all our activities, including our choice of what and how we teach. Now, the Race in the Curriculum Project had its origins in the Race Equality Summit held in March 2014. The summit was organized jointly by university staff, the Oxford University Student Union, and the student-led Campaign for Racial e Awareness and Equality. The summit looked at the experience of home b &E students in relation to access, outreach, and admissions, as well as the experience of all BME students, home and international, undergraduate and graduate, of living and studying in Oxford. One of the main themes to emerge from the summit was the sense among many that Oxford's degree programs focused largely on white or Eurocentric perspectives. Following the summit, it was agreed that the university would organize a series of events to stimulate debate about the curriculum and encourage reviews of, of the curricula. Some of these reviews, as in the Faculty of Theology, predate the summit. Others, as in history, have recently agreed changes that will extend, in history's case, every undergraduate's course of study to include at least one paper on the history of peoples outside Europe. Conversations about race continue, and there is always much more to be done. 
I'm determined, for example, that the university will achieve a race equality charter mark next year as a confirmation of our commitment and a tangible focus for our activities. Many of these conversations may not be comfortable, and I expect Sir Hilary's lecture may not make comfortable listening either. This is one of the many hallmarks of, li of living and working in a wonderful university. This evening's lecture is entitled Britain's Black Debt, Reparatory Justice and the Restoration of Moral Nation Status. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, my old friend, uh, Professor Jim Walvin, who's here somewhere, I saw him earlier. And uh, John Vickers, thank you for that wonderful uh, dinner last night. Uh, great introduction. Uh, Vice Chancellor, I wish you all the best in your tenure. We are both uh, on this journey together. Um, you, you've broken history and you are revolutionary in that regard. Uh, my own university, UWI, is uh, are uh, following you closely. Um, we've not had a female vice chancellor, though I'm told that if a name like Hillary, that, <laughs> I, that the, the conversation has opened. So, so we're, we're pointing at least in the right direction. Uh, but I, I wish you all the very best in, in your journey here and this distinguished university that has done so very well for the world. Uh, many of our Caribbean graduates uh, have come from here and have really impacted our own university. Uh, my, one of my predecessors, uh, the late, great Rex Lefford, uh, one of your Rhodes Scholars and uh, brilliant intellectual, and so many others going way back. And, and each, each year, we celebrate some of our brightest young students who uh, gain Rhodes Scholarships and come here to study. And we keep a close track of them, very proud of their, of their achievements uh, indeed. Uh, this conversation, Vice Chancellor, need not be uncomfortable. It's, it's a question of how one frames uh, one sense of history and the philosophical assumptions which we all share about the role of scholarship and effectively the role of universities as institutions for enlightenment. And, and this is my perspective. I am essentially uh, a student of, of philosophy. Um, I am a, a product of the West Indian migration to, to Britain in the 50s. My parents came here uh, in the 50s, the entire Beckles tribe uh, moved uh, from Barbados. Uh, my father and three of his brothers, who incidentally married three sisters, but all, <laughs> all came here. And I, I, I joined them at the age of 13, and, and therefore uh, I'm a product of the high school system in Birmingham, and uh, thus the university system. So in that sense, I am, you are responsible for what I have become. And, and whatever I am, take, take your share of that, of that responsibility. But my interest has always been philosophical. It's uh, not a coincidence then, at, at the age of 17, I went off to Hull to, to study philosophy. That was my interest as a child. Uh, uh, halfway through the first term of that program, I, I realized it, it lacked historical content. Uh, and as you may recall, uh, the, the Civil War in Nigeria, the aftermath of the Vietnam War, the anti-apartheid movement, all of these issues were around the time of my, of my teenage life. And, uh, and of course, I realized I needed a program that could help me to understand all of this. Uh, and this is why I, I changed my major from philosophy to economic history, which became the subject that looked at the global world in its economic development. And that is where I found, I think I found my niche. And, uh, and journey through um, economic history. So this conversation uh, this evening is uh, a part of all of that. Um, yes, I, I did choose to do my doctorate uh, on the, the Irish and the Caribbean, and the reason was quite simple. Uh, my supervisor, the late John Savile, um, editor of the Socialist Register and uh, great collaborator of Ralph Miliband and Eric Hosborn and so on, I had written this incredible book on rural to urban migration in 17th, 18th century Britain. And he thought it would be appropriate that I should follow those workers who were leaving the villages of, of Britain uh, and going into the cities, uh, many of them port cities, 
but 20% of them would migrate onto the Caribbean. And my task was to track these workers through to the Caribbean and see how they participated in the construction of the slave societies of Jamaica, Barbados, and the Leeward Islands. So uh, through that process, yes, I did become a historian of the, of the Irish in the Caribbean. And it was strange because I was the black guy with the female name <laughs> working on white history. <laughs> so uh, these were some interesting anomalies. But uh, all of that worked, I think, uh, for the better. So this conversation, um, Britain's Black Debt, is, uh, is the subject of the book I published two years ago. Uh, which really uh, emerged out of the global conversations about reparatory justice and what we ought to make of the, the legacies of slavery uh, that are still evident everywhere in the Caribbean. Uh, what we describe as the colonial mess, which is still the subject of most of our efforts. In fact, uh, all we do in the Caribbean, really, is to clean up this mess, and that's what we do. Our governments do nothing else. Education, public health, bad housing, the ghettoization of the working class, all of these are the residual elements of the colonial process. So most of our public expenditure uh, is, in fact, about cleaning up what we call the colonial mess. And uh, this, this legacy, I, I think, and I fear, is really overwhelming the majority of our governments. It's, it is really a tremendous legacy to turn around. If you consider, if you consider for example, that Jamaica, uh, when it became independent in, in 62, uh, the, Britain had, the British had taken Jamaica from the Spanish in 1655. And after 200 years, Jamaica became independent. But at independence, 85% uh, of Jamaicans were functionally illiterate. And the question, therefore, is how do you transform a colony into a nation with 80% illiteracy? Uh, we know of no economic model, uh, no, no body of economic thought that could allow for that rubble to be transformed into a viable nation. But the Jamaicans have to be congratulated because they have made a tremendous effort to carve a nation out of that confusion. And they have done very well and ought to be ought to be congratulated. Uh, the same could be said for most of the Caribbean societies, and it is indeed this legacy uh, that we are treating with as public educators, uh, corporate leaders, and, and so on. It connects all of this into an interesting conversation. I hope I'm pressing the right button as I move along. And, and so the conversation is framed in this context um, that the perception of slavery uh, as a crime against humanity and the, the residual discourses about justice in the context of that history and the long tradition of what we call Christian morality and advocacy. Because the, the, the political movements of the Caribbean, most of them emerge out of trade union issues, evangelical churches, and there is in the region a very strong evangelical moral tradition within the politics and in social relationships. Caribbean folks have had to confront this history every day, and there are conversations about uh, the need to move on, atonement, forgiveness, and, and these conversations coexist alongside conversations about how to uh, repair uh, this, this damage. And of course, it is well understood uh, in all of the Caribbean societies that in the end, this is a conversation about politics and, and about power. But, it is also about how we as individuals construct our identities. And one of the features of slavery is that it denies you access to your own ancestry. 80% uh, of, of black people in the Caribbean know absolutely nothing about their ancestry beyond their great grandparents. They have no idea who they are. There are no records. It was important. Uh, there were property. Uh, property has no ancestry. They, they exist in the records, in inventories, and deeds that speak to property transfer, taxes, alienation of, of mortgages, and so on. But the individuality of history, people's names, uh, are not a part of that record. It's very, very difficult to, to construct who you are beyond your great-grandparents. And this is where, for example, the question is asked. My favorite actor of recent times, I'm a great Peter O'Toole fan, 
but I've transferred my loyalty to Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> and uh, magnificent. And, and the question is, is he my cousin? Which is the, the important question to be asked, because here we are, um, the Cleland Plantation in St. Andrew's Parish in Barbados, where I was born. And, and my, my great-grandmother uh, spent her, her life on the Cumberbatch Plantation, uh, worked on that plantation, the Cleland Estate, uh, from the age of nine uh, to 90, she lived on this estate. And, and her name was Adriana Cumberbatch. And Adriana, my, my great-granny, who helped to raise me, because the traditions are always the same, your parents emigrate and leave the kids behind. And so my parents came to Great Britain, and all the kids were just left with granny and great-gran. But great-gran, uh, Adriana Cumberbatch, lived her entire life and worked on the Cleveland plantation uh, owned uh, by the Cumberbatches. Uh, but the question is, how do I know? Is he my cousin or is he not? How did my great-gran get the name Cumberbatch? Where did that come from? What's the connection? Is it a genetic situation, or was it simply that at emancipation, uh, the, the, the African population were told uh, that to achieve anything, they needed to become baptized in the Christian church. So if you wanted to buy a piece of land, if you wanted to put your kids in a, in a church school, you had to be baptized. And, and being baptized meant you have to acquire a surname. And, and many of these uh, now liberated slaves took the names of their owners. Uh, and so it could be that my folks took Cumberbatch because that's where there were slaves. It could be that there's a genetic relations because that was also the norm. Most of the estates that we have looked at in Barbados, and I have written, uh, my first major book was on, uh, on women and slavery in the Caribbean, which was the first study that looked at the experiences of enslaved women on, on plantations in the Caribbean. And the remarkable thing about that history is that when you go through the, the inventories and the documents of the estates, what you will find is that in almost every instance when a colored child is born, when a colored child is born on the estate, what they call a mixed race child, the young enslaved girl was just 13, 14, 15 years old. So what I did in the, in the early part of my studies was to assemble this entire history of black women giving birth to colored children uh, in their early teens. And the owners of the, 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 the fathers of those children were the owners of the estates and their sons. So um, it's highly probable, possible, therefore, that somewhere there is some Cumberbatch blood knocking around through the vein. But we do not know that is what slavery does. Uh, but it would be wonderful to have a conversation that an academic and an actor should be spawned from the same plantation. Uh, that that is itself is exciting. Uh, this is the estate which I know so well. I used to take my great granny's lunch into the, into the, the sugar fields uh, for her when I was on vacation. And this place, the Cumberbatch's place in Barbados, is a place I know very, very well from my, my childhood. Uh, on the other side, the, 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 paternal, the paternal side, um, the, the, the Earls of Harewood. This estate, the, the, the Bell Sugar Plantation in Barbados, which was bought by the Earls of Harewood in 1782, with, 300, with 282 enslaved Africans on it. This estate remains in the, the family, the Harewood family, until 1975, so that 10 years after Barbados is an independent island, the plantation and the estates are still owned by the, Lord, the Lords of Harewood. And, uh, and David Hayward, the, the, the current uh, Earl of Harewood, who uh, I had lunch with him in Barbados uh, last year, uh, he came to Barbados and handed over the, the documents of the estate so that our students could do interesting research uh, on the economics and the sociology of the estate. My, paternal family worked on this plantation uh, uh, for the Earls of Hayward for the better part of 200 years. Uh, this estate, this great house, is now, as you can see, an abandoned relic because there is a perception that no one wants to touch it. This estate was known to be a house of horror because the, the Earls of Hayward had established a reputation uh, in Barbados for being very brutal slave, slave owners, extremely brutal. 
and the perception of this haunted house. And you may recall from the history that the first Earl of Hereward who bought this estate had committed suicide uh, uh, in his mansion in Hereward Castle. I uh, think they found him uh, in his bathtub with his, his, his wrists uh, slit and his throat cut. The question was always, how did he do all of that? But the, 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 the rumor at the time was that he had taken the Barbados slaves uh, to Leeds to help to construct his castle and that he was known to be such a cruel slave owner that they, they placed a voodoo charm on him. So that was the language that somehow this man was driven into insanity uh, by, by the African ritual which has transferred from Barbados to Yorkshire. But all of that is a history and now this place is, is there still in Barbados. And each time I, I drive past this property, I think of my ancestors and, uh, and the history that, that holds Barbados and Yorkshire and England uh, together. What was remarkable about this is that when, when David came to Barbados, Lord Herewood, I should say, uh, he, he made the most shocking admission to me. He said, you know, this is the first time I've been to Barbados. Now, I found that shocking because the family had been there and had made this extraordinary fortune, arguably the largest fortune ever made from slavery in Barbados, had built the castle. And he had inherited all of this, and he was in his 40s and had never been to the source of his wealth. I found that extraordinary. So I could only assume that the reason he has never been to Barbados was because he chose not to. And that, I suspect, is the uncomfortable nature of the history Vice Chancellor of it should speak. But we, not, we need not be uncomfortable because it's like this is interesting, interesting uh, history. So I, I come to the, the source, the, the beginning of my conversation uh, about emancipation and the end of the slavery regime. And in the conversation, what you find is that one of the most vocal voices in that emancipation discourse of the 1820s was the second Earl of Herewood. The second Earl, the second Earl was absolutely adamant that slavery should not be abolished. Uh, he felt it was, it was Britain's responsibility to maintain slavery. He felt it was good. He said emancipation would destroy the colonies. It would render their property uh, obsolete. And he stood in opposition uh, for 10 years against the abolitionist movement. He was one of the strongest voices uh, in the British Parliament standing against Buxton who was demanding in his intellectual brilliance that the emancipation should be associated with compensation for the enslaved peoples. And I thought Buxton uh, argued that point quite well in his, in his formulation of what an emancipation act should look like. Uh, the Earl of Herewood, on the other hand, became the champion of the view that it's the slave owners uh, who ought to be compensated. And uh, after 10 years of who should be compensated, I think the Earl won that conversation in Parliament. And, and Buxton lost, he lost the debate. And uh, in losing that debate, he made some very strong statements, using very strong language. And, uh, but it was e eventually a discourse between uh, two types of consciousness. Uh, one form of consciousness that spoke about power and wealth and what it ought to do with the world. Uh, another view that spoke about justice, uh, humanity, and enlightenment. And it was really a polarization of those assumptions that framed the Emancipation Act. The, the act itself has been described, and I, I share that view, as as arguably the most racist piece of legislation ever passed by the British Parliament. Now, on the one hand, there is uh, the, the discourse about emancipation as a, a triumph for British liberalism, uh, and that argument has stood the test of time, and I understand that it is still the general belief that it is so. But if you examine this legislation carefully, and you, you, you read the speeches of Buxton and how he went about arguing for emancipation, you can see why. The act itself had to recognize that the 800,000 Africans were property and not human beings. 
the British courts had fudged this issue for 200 years. There was always doubt as to whether the slaves or the enslaved people were really property, non-human chattel. It, it was understood that that was the function in the colonies. But there was doubt as to whether British law had actually positively recognized that the enslaved people were not human at all, but just chattels. But in order to compensate the slave owners, the parliament had to take a prior step for the, the treasury to cough up the money to pay the slave owners. The act had to first of all recognize that yes, these enslaved Africans are indeed property. They are not human beings. And we are taking away the property of our citizens. And therefore we have to pay property compensation. And it, it is within this act that we see for the first time an explicit articulation that the enslaved Africans were not human beings at all, but no more than property. Even though we had read the judgment of Lord Mansfield in the Zong case, uh, when he had said no, that the Africans are like so many heads of cattle and, and therefore uh, property and no more. But the government of Britain now decides, yes, there are indeed property, and we are taking away the property of citizens, and we have to pay property compensation. But importantly, what the act did was to force the enslaved people to pay for their own emancipation. Now, this is where the, the economics of emancipation runs afoul of the rhetoric about emancipation as enlightenment. The, the British government did decide to pay uh, the 20 million compensation to the slave owners. But that was after uh, the government had completed its audits uh, to, to conclude that the 800,000 enslaved Africans were valued at 47 million pounds. Uh, this was a value that was placed uh, on them and the government decided they would pay only 20 million. The question was left, who would pay the remaining 27 million because you had to pay full compensation. The, the act of emancipation made reference to full, full and just compensation. And so the government decided to craft an emancipation act that would allow for 20 million to be handed over from the public treasury to the slave owners, and the 27 million the enslaved would have to pay themselves. And the act was designed very skillfully to create a process called the apprenticeship, where the, the now freed slaves would work for free for another decade. That was a master stroke. And the language which was used was interesting. That period was called the apprenticeship. And in the rhetoric of the House of Assembly, they spoke about the transition in which the former slave owners would adjust to the former slaves and transition from a slave economy to a wage economy. And this apprenticeship was the transition to allow for the movement from a slave economy to a wage economy. In fact, what they had crafted, and the records document this, it was a mechanism to allow for $27 million of free labor to be transferred to the slave owners to extract the remaining 27 million. And so in the end, the, 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 en the enslaved people paid more for their freedom than the British government had paid to give effect to it. And that, that in itself is very, very significant. But you do, not, you do not see references to that point in the rhetoric of parliament. The parliament is the documentation speaks to the glorious act, the enlightenment uh, of the parliament, the vision for the future. Uh, but most historians ought to know that if you, if you really want to understand processes such as emancipations, you do not confine yourself to the rhetoric of the minutes of the House of Commons. You go to the minutes of the committees because it is in the committees that the work is done. It is in the subcommittees of parliament that the technical work is done and true effect of the thought uh, are explored. So 
from a Caribbean perspective, from the perspective of the descendants of the enslaved, the act was extremely racist in its conception that the black people were not human beings but property, and also the fact that they were forced to pay the greater part of the compensation for their own, for their own freedom. This Buxton referred to as a betrayal. Buxton was very clear as uh, an enlightened intellectual politician that this Emancipation Act was a betrayal of the African peoples. And that's the language he used. That was a construct which he used. So it's not for me to invent that construct. It is there in the language that this is what had happened. And the, the, the British, importantly, had structured their Emancipation Act around what had happened with Haiti and the French uh, um, five to six years earlier. Uh, you know, when the Haitians were uh, having won their independence, uh, declared their independence in uh, 1804, and 1821, uh, the Haitians are celebrating, uh, 1825, I'm sorry, they're celebrating 21 years of independence. And Port-au-Prince is a, celebrat a celebratory place. If there are parties going on, uh, 21 years of freedom of independence. But while they were having their celebrations, there were warships in the harbors. And the French position was, we, we're not going to recognize your independence until you pay compensation. Uh, and uh, the British enforced that view, as did all the other European powers, that if Haiti wants to be recognized, it has to pay property compensation to the enslavers. And uh, the, the Haitian cabinet, uh, went into retreat to, to make that decision. The young nation had been isolated for 21 years, uh, and they decided to reinsert themselves into the world economy and to pay the compensation. Thus, the 1826, the 1826 treaty in which uh, the Haitian government agreed to pay France the 150 million gold francs, uh, representing the the economic value of the, of the enslaved Haitian population. And it, it was interesting that many of the members of the cabinet were former slaves, so they had to pay their own, they had to agree to pay their own compensation on their own value. And uh, the, the British Emancipation Act uh, picks up on the French agreement where uh, our slave owners were paid uh, compensation. Some interesting cartoons. This is one of my favorite cartoons, uh, where the, the enslaved population in the Caribbean uh, celebrating the emancipation. But then you have the, the businessmen, the aristocrats, the merchants, the, the clergy. All of these people are John Bull uh, lining up to receive their compensation, and, and thus the polarization of the discourse uh, about freedom and compensation. Where, where is the cash? John Bull asks. And here you can see uh, basically some indications of, of the value uh, placed on the enslaved populations of the Caribbean and the amount which the British, which the government agreed to pay. Uh, you, can see, you can see here the Caribbean values in the British compensation. The argument was that the slave owners had inflated the value of their slaves. Uh, the role of the British government was to bring the values down and to pay that compensation. And we can see there. Um, this is an interesting image. I had a seminar with students on the Mona campus in Jamaica uh, who wanted me to speak about this. Uh, who, who, who are we? The, the students asked, who, who are we? And I said, okay, well, well, you are the descendants of the 1.2 million Africans who the British brought into Jamaica. Uh, so the, the British brought 1.2 million Africans into Jamaica, but at emancipation, there were only 300,000 remaining. The question is, how do you bring 1.2 million Africans onto an island, and after 200 years, you, you have only 300,000? It raises the question about slavery, uh, not only as a system of legal control and political management, but also the, the, the genocidal aspect of slavery. It's only 25% of the enslaved population survived. Uh, in Barbados, the, the figures are about the same. Uh, 600,000 
600,000 Africans taken by the British to Barbados, and at the end of the slavery, there were only 83,000 remaining. So the horrendous survival rates. And so these young people in Jamaica, they are the descendants of this 25% survival. These are the survivors of a Holocaust uh, that had decimated the African population across the West Indies. And we all know that if there is one abiding feature of slavery in the Caribbean, it was the fact that unlike most places where slavery existed in the hemisphere, in the Caribbean, the enslaved population did not reproduce itself. In the US South, they reproduced themselves, the population grew. Uh, in Brazil, they expanded, they grew. In the Caribbean, it reversed itself. Uh, and when you go through the documentation uh, on these individual estates, like the estates of the Earl of Harewood and uh, the Cumberbatches, what you see is this constant reference to burials and death. On each estate, every day, three, four, five adults and children are being buried, a constant daily burial of, of people on these estates, uh, reflecting this horrendous mortality that characterized slavery uh, in the Caribbean. And this is the great house which I showed you at the beginning, the Bell Estate, which was a ruin. This is what it looked like in 1966. As you can see, it's a beautiful building. It's hard to imagine that the structure I showed you earlier, and if you need me to go back to it again, imagine this is now the great house. This is 1966. This is our queen and her cousin, the Earl of Harewood. But if you go back and look at it, uh, that is what it looks like now. Uh, but here we are. This is what it looked like then. Uh, when Her Majesty uh, came out to Barbados uh, to celebrate with her cousin, the Earl of Harewood, uh, on the Sugar Estate. Uh, the remarkable thing about the photograph is that the photograph speaks to the, the merger of, of royalty and slaveocracy. Um, I think it was 1922. 1922 was when uh, the Earl of Harewood married Princess Mary. and married into the royal family. The families had coexisted side by side. Of course, we know that the, the British royal family had started the slave trade in an organized context. Uh, the, the Royal African Company of 1672, uh, which was established by the Duke of York as the chairman who later became King James II. Uh, the Duke of York was the chairman and they built this joint stock company uh, to bring 2,000 uh, Africans from the Gold Coast per year to Barbados and the Leeward Islands. So the, the slave trading companies were, were constructed first in an organized way by the royal family, but now the, the, the royalty and the aristocracy, or the slaveocracy, as we call it, uh, have now converged with the, the marriage of the Harewoods uh, into, into the Windsors. And so, uh, our queen comes out to Barbados to visit her cousin on his sugar plantation, which was bought, as I said, by the family uh, in 1782. And you can see the house is still in order, the servants, the servants are there in the background, and this is a contemporary image. This is uh, a few months after Barbados had become an independent nation. And so uh, one can actually write a major monograph on this photograph. This photograph is, is, is filled with, with history of, as to how two distinguished families converged on the sugar plantation uh, uh, of, of slavery. And, um, and uh, this is the photograph I used uh, on the cover of my book, uh, because in, in a sense, the monograph is really to explain why this photograph how could this photograph be taken? What is the history behind this photograph? So you roll back 200 years and you bring it forward uh, to, this, to this extraordinary uh, moment. And then it comes right in where our Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, uh, whose family had received considerable slave compensation in the Emancipation Act. Uh, there were major slave owners, the Earl of Fife, major slave owners in Jamaica, 
uh, as well. And you see how all of this compensation for slavery is interwoven into our, into our reality. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, Prime Minister and his family, the compensation uh, which they receive uh, in 1838. Uh, the Royal African Company, and this is the crest of the Royal African Company uh, that was stationed uh, on, the, on the Gold Coast with Barbados. Uh, again, uh, the first Earl who uh, established this incredible monument uh, to enslavement with over a thousand enslaved uh, people in Jamaica, uh, 500 in Barbados, and that's the Bel Estate there. Uh, not bad for a poor white family who came out from Britain in the 1640s. A hundred years later, they are the wealthiest commoner, common family in Britain. It's, it speaks of the economics of this process. Uh, they are the estates of the earls in Jamaica, most of central Jamaica. You can see the estates. There are the estates owned by the earls of Herewood and Barbados. Uh, tremendous, tremendous control of land and space and property. Uh, not a bad house to build out of slavery. It's, uh, as the students would say in Jamaica, it's a nice crib. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's what is expressed out of this extraordinary history of slavery. And there we go, the, the, the marriage of royalty and slavery, uh, the sixth Earl and, and Princess Mary in 1922. The question then is, how do we look at all this history? Uh, what is really reparatory justice? And, and how does one engage all of this? I spoke earlier about engaging what we call the colonial mess that has resulted from this interest in history. Uh, the conversation has focused, um, I think, has been derailed, I think. I think the British media, the British media has not been fair, uh, I think and how they look at this conversation. I think they have been a little unfair in the sense that the, the perception that uh, reparatory justice is about black folks in the Caribbean standing around on street corners expecting handouts, uh, and the British taxpayer uh, having to put their hands in their pocket and hand out cash to, to undeserving people. And that's the paradigm that really has been formulated about the reparatory justice process. That is certainly uh, not uh, what I signed up for. I was asked to lead the Barbados, the Barbados delegation uh, to the UN conference in Durban in 2001. And uh, it was an interesting conference because, first of all, I, on the first day I arrived and found myself seated. And I, I'm, sanguished, I'm sanguished between, uh, we're seated alphabetically. I'm, I'm sanguished between Arafat and Castro. Uh, <laughs> and and, um, and I, I have to formulate my thoughts while I'm, you know. <laughs> but, but basically, we were having a conversation uh, with the British delegation about how to engage this history and, and what we ought to make of it. And uh, I was chosen by the, the heads of governments to, to be the spokesman because I am an academic, I am a historian, uh, they understand my own philosophical orientation, and they believe that we need to craft something positive and developmental out of this. Uh, it's not about recrimination, it's about how to take the past and turn it on its head and do something remarkable in the future. That's really what it's about. But in those conversations, there was a tremendous pushback from the British delegation uh, the British delegation said, listen, uh, slavery was no crime. Uh, these are the arguments which were put to us at Durban. I ironically, uh, the British delegation was led by Baroness Amos, uh, and, um, th and that was interesting. Um, and her position was, uh, the Tony Blair government, uh, slavery was no crime, we had legalized it. So it was legal and therefore no crime. Well, yes, and our response was, okay, okay, fine, but uh, our, my recollection of German history is that uh, Hitler had also used the Chancellor and other people to legalize the Holocaust, uh, and, and that they had said, yes, well, the Holocaust, to march people through gas chambers and, and destroy human life uh, had its legal infrastructure surrounded it, so uh, let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> 
that racism is passe, uh, there's no racism, this is a post-racial world, and that black folks have to start whining and think of the future. Which was interesting, because this is what Prime Minister Cameron told the Jamaican parliament. Let's get, let's get over it. Okay. So the position then was um, no apology, no regret. Uh, go get a culture uh, that the persistence of poverty in the Caribbean has to do with the fact that black folks are lacking the developmental culture. And therefore, without that culture, they won't develop. And they're poor because they have no culture of development. Um, you have no wealth because you have corruption and so on. So all of these kind of arguments were placed uh, to justify a position. Uh, we had asked um, Lord Gifford to, to work with us on this. Uh, he, of course, had uh, written into the records of the House of Lords a, a very strong argument that there has to be reparatory justice, that Britain should heal this wound, and, and that going into the 21st century, uh, Britain is on the cusp of doing something magnificent, and, and all of us should find a way to encourage uh, the British state and citizens uh, to deal with this history, come to terms with it, and, and establish what I call its moral legitimacy in the 21st century. It, it's, difficult to, it's difficult to ignore all of this and to run roughshod over it, uh, while at the same time having a reputation for enlightenment. So uh, our position is that let us, let us sit and look at this. Um, uh, it is particularly important for Great Britain, I believe, because while the Portuguese had shipped more Africans across the Atlantic than the British, the, the economics of this case shows that the British had made more money out of it uh, because the British were better at it. Uh, they had better financial systems, uh, they had better administrations of finance, they had good banks, they had a system of brokers and agents, and they understood the economics of, and financing of international trade much better. So, yes, so as historians we know, that uh, the British slave traders were uh, indeed able to extract a greater revenue out of this business than their European competitors, and that they took, they took the lion share uh, of this. And we see this is just some of the structures of the, the built directly. I'm always impressed by, by William Beckford, who, who built his own church, uh, uh, who said, I want to have my own church because when I'm speaking with my God, I don't wish to be interrupted. Uh, and there, there you go. So uh, there's a whole history of enrichment, which is there. Um, uh, the Church of England uh, doing very well. These uh, some of the leading slave owners, all the aristocracies and so on, and the banks. Uh, these are some of the financial institutions that were born out of slave trading and slavery. These companies, these merchant houses and financial institutions were re-engineered, rebranded, and refashioned into what you see now. And uh, you see all of these contemporary banks on the high street, but these are the antecedent structures out of which these banks emerge, and, and so on. The Americans are much better at this than the British, I should say. Uh, the, the Americans have done the right thing. Uh, they have looked at all of their major commercial institutions, and all of them that were based on slavery extracted wealth out of slave labor, uh, took slaves as collateral for mortgages, and so on. All of the American banks have engaged their communities and have established a method to deal with it. They have established scholarships. Many of them have made donations to community projects. So uh, one, one can imagine then the question has to be, why is it that the British institutions have not done what the American institutions have done? Every day, American institutions are emerging with their records. Some of them discover their records accidentally, that they didn't know that 150 years ago that they were taking slaves as collateral and mortgages. And they have done the right thing, one by one. So they have, in a sense, shown the way on how to treat with this history. On the websites of many of the British banks, they make reference to this. They make reference to it on the websites, but they don't go any further. There's no conversation about, well, is there a moral obligation which we need to discharge in relation to this history? And I, I believe that we ought to encourage these institutions uh, to take hold of this past uh, in a different kind of way. Uh, the Church of England has uh, made their formal apologies, which is very commendable of the, of the bishops, the archbishop. 
uh, for the fact that there were some of the largest slave owners in the Caribbean. And um, the quadrant and estates are here. Uh, you know, this is the, the Bishop of Exeter who received more compensation uh, for his enslaved peoples than any other slave owner in Great Britain. But again, the quadrant and estates in Barbados are still there uh, in need. And uh, yesterday, uh, uh, John Vickers and myself had a wonderful conversation uh, about the quadrant and history. The old college is still there, which was built uh, by the quadrant and family. It's a theology college. And I thought how wonderful it would be to transform that theology college which was built in the early 18th century on the Codrington slave plantations, uh, to turn that into a global center for moral discourse, so uh, a global center for the study of diplomacy, to, to bring it and give it a 21st century identity. It would be wonderful to do that. Uh, Nick Draper, a brilliant scholar, um, pleasure working with him over the years on, on, some, on some of this. I want to go quickly to... Um, the, the CARICOM plan. I was asked by uh, CARICOM to establish a task force, a commission, to look at ways in which we could frame a reparatory justice conversation uh, with, with Great Britain and, and to link the legacy of slavery with a development agenda uh, in which both sides of the conversation can go into the future with a sense of, of mutual dignity. And uh, we looked at it and we said, okay. Uh, first of all, reparatory justice is about development. It's about helping to confront uh, this legacy. The reaction has been in some places um, that uh, these islands are now independent. You are now responsible for yourselves. Your future's in your own hands. Uh, we are over and finished. Okay, so that is fine. Um, uh, Dudley Thompson, who is a distinguished Jamaican Pan-Africanist, uh, said to me uh, once in, in Kenya, uh, he said, listen, this is the, the metaphor you ought to use. This is how to look at it. Imagine uh, you're the wife of a tyrant, and your husband has been brutalizing you through the length, the decades of this marriage and you have suffered all the emotional and physical abuse. Each time you, you stand up and express your desire for recognition and dignity, you get a slap. And this is what you have to go through. So imagine that uh, the process. Then um, you finally find the courage to, to pick up your children and leave the tyrant. And you go away and you celebrate the fact that you are now independent of this tyrant and you're celebrating your freedom. Uh, that's fine. But in the process, what you have done, you have consigned your children to poverty because you have walked away with your triumph, but the property that you have helped him to accumulate, the property the two of you have accumulated, you have walked away from it and you are now left uh, without a resource. Uh, you are now in poverty and your children are consigned to poverty. So rather than jump for celebration of your freedom, you should have seen a lawyer uh, to get your just share of the collectively accumulated resources. So the tyrant husband then says to you, when you come to make your claim, by the way, I'm, I'm now remarried. I have moved on. I, I have now joined the European Union, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I, it's, I, have, I have a new wife, and I've moved on. Um, sorry, it's a, it's a closed chapter. There's nothing to discuss. Uh, get on with it. What reparatory justice says, is these are the children who are now dispossessed, disenfranchised. We are the children. So we have now said, hold on, Dad, hold on a second. You gave our mother a raw deal. You gave us a raw deal. We want to talk about our education, our health. We want you to come back and participate in our upbringing. And that's what we're asking you to do. We're not asking for handouts. We're asking for a moral conversation, a legal conversation about justice. You have to make an investment in our education and our health and come back to the table. That, in a nutshell, is what the reparatory justice process is about. It's about dealing with these issues, the health issues, um, 
we have this chronic disease explosion in the Caribbean. 60% of all the black people in the Caribbean over the age of 60 have type 2 diabetes hypertension. Not surprising. Slavery is over, but we are now in the jet stream of it. Imagine then you put, as in the case of Barbados, the first slave society, you import 600,000 people, you put them on an island for 200 years, you give them salt fish and salt pork every day, uh, you brutalize them 24 hours of labor per day, you sell their children, you rape their wives, and you carry out this horrendous experiment of how to make money out of human degradation. And fine, at the end of that, what do you expect? The people are stressed out. They cannot metabolize sugar and salt because that's what they had. When I was a child uh, growing up on the plantations of the Kamabachas, uh, in the midst of your hunger and your, your, your poverty, the children would go into the kitchen and take a handful of sugar and eat it. And that was the norm for all working class children. You would just take a handful of sugar and consume it to survive through the next couple of hours. So now we have a serious problem because the philosophy was eat what you grow. Okay, we grew sugar and we ate it. Now we have a diabetes explosion on the island. Barbados is now known for two things. Beautiful tourism product, the amputation capital of the world. Every day in Barbados, someone loses a limb. We are now <coughs> the amputation capital of the world because of the rampant explosion of diabetes. So we have the illiteracy, we have the diabetes, we have, all the, we have no institutions, there are no museums. There's some wonderful museums of slavery in Britain, some <laughs> lovely archives. Not one museum to slavery in the Caribbean, not one. Difficult to say to a government that is struggling with fiscal deficits and currency devaluations to take five million pounds and build a museum to slavery when there are other major pressing issues, but no museums to look at this history. Uh, research, technology, um, universities, of course, we know from the, the work we have done on hypertension um, that the hypertension drugs don't work as well on black folks, on West Indians, as they do on British. And we've done comparative studies in Britain, in West Africa, and in the Caribbean. It's fascinating to know that if you are English and you take a hypertension drug, your body has a 95% response, which is wonderful. If you're black from the Caribbean, you have a 70% response. So most black folks in the Caribbean are in and out of different drugs because one, you become immune, it doesn't work. And you know. But the remarkable thing is that the West Africans have the same response as the English. That's remarkable. So the drugs work on the West Africans exactly the same way they work on the British. But the black folks in the Caribbean have a suppressed reaction because of the genetic transformations and the changes that have gone through in our bodies, our metabolisms, our genetic changes, and so on because of slavery. And so we are doing work, biochemical work, to find a way to improve the responses of black Caribbean peoples to these drugs. This is highly expensive biochemical research, as you all know. The pharmaceuticals say, we're not going to sponsor this research for you. Why? Because there are only seven or eight million of you. If, if it was an African problem, voila, we would invest in research because there are 200 million people. But six million, we're not going to spend the money on this. So slavery is over, and a new kind of slavery is taking place, the subordination to the legacies and the consequences of it. So these are the issues that we are speaking about. The indigenous people, I'm going to finish in two minutes. The indigenous peoples of the Caribbean who have survived. 15 million, Afri 15 million indigenous peoples occupied the Eastern Caribbean before the Columbus intervention. Barbados is unique in that regard. When the English arrived in Barbados in 1625 to colonize, the colonizing party says, we have just arrived on this beautiful island, and there are no people, an empty island, no people, but there are houses everywhere. Barbados was a ghost island because it was a densely populated island, but because of its topography, the native people could not survive the slave raids 
So the Portuguese were raiding the island, the Spanish were raiding the island, looking for slaves to take to Mexico, to Brazil, and of course the island was decimated. So the English arrived and found an empty island with, with houses everywhere. We have offered scholarships to the indigenous peoples. In my time as principal of the Barbados campus, we instituted an indigenous peoples scholarship. Every year, the Barbados campus offers 10 full scholarships to indigenous children. We go into the reservations of Dominica, St. Vincent, Belize, and we bring these kids who are on reservations, bring them through the secondary process, and bring them into the university, uh, all expenses paid, as part of the moral response of the Barbados campus uh, to the fact that it was an island that began against the background of genocide. These are things we can do and should do. And this is the approaches which we have adopted in the search for reparatory justice. We are about to establish uh, a center for reparations research at the University of the West Indies. Uh, we are engaged with reparations movements across the world. A, a fair amount of mentoring is done by the Jewish reparations commissions. We, uh, we spend a fair amount of time speaking to our Jewish colleagues uh, about the process of pursuing uh, justice and focusing on education. So these are some of the issues here, technology transfer. And I know that here in this extraordinary, uh, beautiful university, this is Lord Gifford uh, speaking to uh, the Minister of Culture in Jamaica, who is second from the left, uh, Minister Hannah, uh, about how Jamaica can frame its conversation with the British government. I know that in this remarkable Oxford University, uh, you have um, <coughs> a conversation taking place uh, about the role's history and legacy, and of course, there's a quadrant to an issue. And I believe that with the collective intelligence and the will of this great university, that you will find a way to confront this past. Uh, it, it cannot be brushed away, it cannot be set aside. The question is, how do you take this, this history? And the fact is that we have to recognize, we have to recognize, and we have to accept that some of these persons who have built reputations out of triumphalism of military conquest, uh, some of them were really, in fact, genocidal maniacs. And they really committed these tremendous atrocities across the world. And uh, universities that are committed to enlightenment, to justice, to scholarship, to, to ethical research, uh, shaping the world, making it what it has to be, especially for the young people, this long 21st century ahead of us, uh, we can do much better. And I am a great supporter of, of efforts of enlightenment, of justice, and I, I do hope that this university can find its way to, to evolve with a project that makes rational sense of all of this. I wish you good luck, and if I can play a part in any way, please let me know. Congratulations, and well done. for that thought-provoking, riveting, and indeed disturbing lecture. I know it has provoked many questions. I'm sure it has. Uh, but before I open the floor to questions, just like to say, you said at the very beginning that we, by which I trust you mean the British educational system is responsible yeah. for what you've become. I'm sure everybody in this room would share my view that I'm sure we're all very proud of what you've become. Um, in order to... Um, manage the question and answer session, I'd like to invite uh, d um, one of our own lecturers who works closely in uh, Kingston, Jamaica, um, who is Dr. David Howard, who is University Lecturer in Sustainable Urban Development and Director of Research at the Department of Continuing Education, affiliated at, at Kellogg College. So Thanks, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sir Hilary, for an engaging, enlightening um, um, lecture. I'm, I'm sure there are many questions, so we'll leap straight into the first question. Um, there's a microphone going around, so uh, who would like to open our debate? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> thank you very much for that lecture. You, parts of it left me absolutely speechless. Um, I just want to ask you, I was a bit shocked that you praised 
Oxford and Oxbridge as an institution, because I see them as being part of the problem. I'll give you a quick example. I recently attended a book launch by, it was a Cambridge academic, and his book was about on Heroditus. I know a lot about Heroditus, so I went there quite keen. And he refused to acknowledge that what Heroditus said about Africa, how they were standing on the shoulders of Africa, and he said a lot, and, he, and so for me, this institution just produces brainwashed people who come out with a Eurocentric, Eurocentric idea that completely adds to making me a non-person and making the contribution of people who look like me a non-entity. So I, actually, I just see this institution as being not good, and I wouldn't recommend it for those reasons. So I'm surprised you praised it. But my other question is, I think, don't you need to say that when Haiti, and I'll and I say this very quickly, when Haiti got, was, was independent, got its freedom, don't you think you need to say that the system, the European system, comprised together to prevent them from enjoying the freedom of their success? And just to say that the whole system is controlled by the West, and that's a fantastic example of how they control it. Thank you. Yes. yes. Well, yes, and indeed, the points you're making are valuable because we are looking at empire, we're looking at uh, power, we're looking at what power can do uh, and has done in the world. And, and all of these conversations about slavery, emancipation, uh, what you do see is how power can run roughshod over other voices. Uh, in the 17th century, for example, uh, when I was working on, on, white, on white indentured labor in the Caribbean, uh, the language about exploiting workers was paramount. All forms of labor, white labor, brown labor, black labor, we were going to make a fortune out of sugar. And we were prepared to enslave whoever was available to us to do so. And they pushed the, the white workers into a circumstance where they were given seven years of slavery. So all of this is about power. When the system was being built, there were those voices. The 17th century literature is filled uh, with voices uh, in this country that said, you know what? This slavery model which we are building, it is wrong. It's a crime. It is illegal. It ought not to happen. But the power system which you describe ran rough shot over those voices pushed them aside, and formulated a concept called the national interest. And the moment the empowered classes defined slavery as in the national interest, then to oppose it was to oppose the national interest. And that is how it worked. Uh, in the emancipation conversation, similarly, those persons like Buxton who stood in parliament and said that there has to be justice for the enslaved people. There has to be justice for the African people. The groups of persons with the power ran roughshod over those voices. And that is how history has always been. I spoke of this university in its two dimensions. Yes, this university is a part of that imperial history. Without a doubt, it's a part of that legacy and tradition. But it has also produced some brilliant scholars, has produced some brilliant students, have done some remarkable research. All of that exists side by side. Our job in, as persons who are crafting the future has to identify ways in which to extract the good, uh, form solidarity with it, identify those sources that are about enlightenment, work with those sources, and create a better world, while at the same time acknowledging that there are people who have always worked in universities who really don't belong in universities. There, there is always that consciousness among some individuals who really, spiritually, do not really belong inside of a university. But that has always been a history in all institutions, including the church, in politics, everywhere. So we take it as we get it, we take it as it comes, and we try to shape the future. I think there's a question at the front. I'm just there. Thank you very much. My heart is in lament, and there's a lacrimosa going on, but I'm really grateful that you reminded us of some of the things that we needed to be reminded of, particularly around our history. And I think there are many of us who are going to go home and ponder and cry, but ponder and want to do some action. And it is to the actions that I want to address my question. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals were launched uh, in New York in September, and certainly in the jobs I do, and a lot of people working in education, we are encouraging schools to think about sustainable, de sustainable development and the goals up to 2030. But 
the, ar the argument about reparations is missing from that. And one of the things I'm asking is, how can, what tools can you guide us to that would assist us so that when we're having that discussion about sustainability and the future of the planet and global development, that we can say this is central to that development? Well, Alan, what you have done is just to, is just to focus on my primary agenda at this moment. Um, we are involved right now in uh, working through a partnership with the SUNY uh, group, uh, the largest university system uh, probably in the world, uh, 64 campuses. And uh, we have met with the SUNY Board of Trustees and we have formed an agreement that SUNY and UWI will partner in creating an institute for sustainable development and leadership. So we are about to sign those agreements uh, where the UWI will have uh, a major partnership with the SUNY and the, the two universities will come together to create this new institute. This institute will uh, focus on those sustainable goals. And so this institute will work on behalf of the CARICOM governments to become the capacity building agency and the delivery agency to allow the Caribbean to achieve those goals that they have signed up to. The leadership part is important. SUNY has said to us, and we have said to them, uh, the chairman of the SUNY group, uh, Mr. Carl McCall, who is uh, chairman of the board, I said to, I said to Carl, how, how did you feel as the chairman of the board of trustees of the largest university system in New York, and you sat back and watched your city collapsing into social chaos? <coughs> People on the streets, police brutality, People on the street speaking about the civil rights, their human rights, their injustices. How do you feel as the, as the leader of this massive university structure and right before your eyes, your city is in social meltdown? And many of those people on the streets were Caribbean folks. So we had this conversation and we said, yes, as university leaders, we have a responsibility to do our best to, to empower citizens to to better understand their world and to have better lives. And so out of that conversation uh, about what happened in New York, uh, then the UN uh, Sustainable Goals, uh, two universities came together and said, let us do something about it. And now we've had several meetings and now we're going to establish this jointly owned institute to produce the next generation of young leaders. Uh, not leaders only in terms of political parties, but if you are living in Brooklyn, and you want to become the mayor, or you want to be a librarian, or you want to become an uh, NGO person, you want to be chief police commissioner, uh, the universities have to get together and produce a, a, a program on leadership for young people. Uh, what are the skills that young people will need to be effective leaders in the 21st century? Uh, so, so the SUNY UWI partnership is going to unfold very nicely to intervene precisely on the sustainable goals and helping the young people of the Americas to understand leadership responsibilities quite differently. So yes, it is, it is an example of what universities can do by coming together to chart a new direction. Thank you. Okay. There's a question at the back and then there'll be one just there. Thank you. So, uh, just at the back and then um, there's a lady in the red coat and then there. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Beckles. Um, Timar from Jamaica. <laughs> Past student of UWI. Congratulations, well done. <laughs> yes, um, so the, the counter argument a lot of uh, people use when they, 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 they talk about reparation, right, is that the UK and the other European states are, are doing a lot in terms of aid to the Caribbean and other places, right? Um, for example, the UK announced uh, 300 million pounds in aid to the Caribbean, right? Of which I know uh, they recently donated 25 million pounds uh, to construct a prison, right? Um, I would like to, to get your view on uh, whether or not, how you see this, uh, this aid that uh, the UK is given, for example, and uh, yeah, kind of how, how do you see it? Do you, do you see it actually achieving the goals that you actually want to achieve um, on your mission um, to, to, yeah. to gain reparation? Well, the, the, whole, the whole concept of aid uh, 
uh, emerges from a very different philosophical position. Uh, and that is not what we are speaking about. We are not speaking about aid uh, that ultimately is seen as a kind of philanthropy. That's not what we're, what we're speaking about. We're speaking about development cooperation uh, and reparative justice, which is altogether a very different concept. Uh, you, you give aid, and the aid comes attached with all the strings. Uh, and the, the strings attached to the aid are developmental of the giver. Uh, and we know that. But also, too, uh, what is given by way of aid is, uh, is, is pittance compared with what is extracted in the first place. So there's an imbalance in that whole conversation. We're speaking about mutually respected development cooperation, where government to governments, institutions to institutions, universities to universities, get together to identify certain peculiar features that are inhibiting human development and work towards those goals collectively. I believe that universities have an important role to play in all of this, which is why I uh, adopted or uh, agreed to perform the function as the chairman of this, of this government commission, uh, to create networks of cooperation to identify this. I'm particularly interested in, the, the, as I said, the biochemical research around hypertension diabetes. Uh, how can universities get together to, to do their research jointly? Uh, I was very impressed with what has happened with Newcastle. Uh, the University of Newcastle and the Barbados campus of UWI got together five years ago to work on diabetes research jointly. And together, they have now identified a way in which they could reverse this diabetes if first, if early identified. And we were able to go to Sir Richard Branston and say to him, well, listen, could you help to fund this project? So UWI, Newcastle, and Sir Richard came together, and he made a significant investment. And now our researchers have found a solution. Uh, if uh, within a month or two, uh, you discover that your sugar levels are out of control, there is a strategy uh, where we can take you through a, a zero carbohydrate diet, uh, high intensity exercise. Uh, the, the pancreas, which is now filled with fat, that prevents the insulin process of being generated. And we can, actually, we can actually expunge the fat out of the pancreas to allow it to continue to regenerate insulin. So now we have identified that strategy and now we have people who we are now uh, benefiting from this kind of thing. This is going to be revolutionary. We make a tremendous impact upon the world. So these are the kinds of things that we are speaking about. Uh, the AIDS conversation and all of that, and so on, that's a different world. Uh, we are speaking about technology, about science, collaboration, uh, universities, mutual respect, building institutions that will help us to turn this history around. And we do need to turn this history around. Thank you. Um, question from the middle. Thank you. So thank you very much for all that you shared. I, I learned a lot through your presentation. I'd just like to follow up on um, what he had said earlier and, and that question about Oxford and, and addressing the history. And my own hesitation with Oxford is um, the general sense. You said, you said earlier how when you were in the, your conversations in Durban when people were saying, you know, get over it. And there's that sense of um, students who are trying to, to get the university to address the past being told to get over it. And just, um, I'm not sure if you followed the whole conversation, but for example, the chancellor said, that you know, those students who are unable to embrace Cecil Rhodes' legacy should think about being educated elsewhere. And he mentioned, you know, China, for example. And so I find it very difficult, you know, in saying, you know, you're saying that um, Oxford, yes, it's it's a it's a great institution, and you should have this conversation side by side. But there's still very much the sense of of being told get over it, or if you're if they do allow such conversations to happen, that it should be within the parameters they set out. So once again, they're the ones with the power and students who are trying to get these conversations going are disempowered through the process. So how can you, um, you know, you being a chancellor, how can you encourage um, the leaders of this university to begin to see it in a different way? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> well, allow me to say that I am here uh, this evening with you because of my own uh, engagement with student radicalism. Uh, as an undergraduate at Hull, uh, I was engaged in student politics, I was on a guild, and we discovered back then in the early 70s uh, 
that our university was one of the major investors in, in South African apartheid. Uh, our university had a tremendous amount of its resources uh, invested in the apartheid regime. As a student, I felt that this was wrong. And I made a number of speeches on the campus. Uh, I made a representation to the chancellor. I, I, I mentioned to, <laughs> to, to John last night that I, I, I traveled from Hull down to the House of Lords to speak with my chancellor, uh, Lord Wilberforce. Uh, and to go to see him, to say, to say him, Chancellor, um, our university was built around the legacy of William Wilberforce. And to be invested in its resources in South Africa under apartheid, your ancestor and our founder must be turning in his grave. And, and we made that representation to the Chancellor in his chamber in the House of Lords. Well, he sat there and said nothing to us. Uh, then he said, well, we wish you a good journey back to Hull. Uh, but guess what? Uh, he intervened. He intervened, and Hull University became one of the first universities in, in Britain to divest its money out of apartheid because of the student agitation and the student concern. Many years later, uh, I graduated. Uh, I was recruited as a trainee accountant. I was going to be a chartered accountant. That was my profession. I had an interest in that, job security and so on. Uh, and I'm sitting on a subway. I'm sitting on a subway uh, going to work in Holborn. Uh, I'm 20 years old and looking forward to being an accountant. And lo and behold, uh, the intervention of the ancestors, one of my professors came on the train and sat next to me. What are the chances of that? Came on the train, the Northern Line, sat next to me and said, my God, Beckles, what's become of you? And I said, well, I'm going to be an accountant professor. He said, no, you're not. <laughs> he said, no, you're not. He said, you give me a call tomorrow and I will sort you out. And I called him and he said, listen, the Hull PhD scholarship has not yet been allocated. You are going to come back to Hull and do your PhD and give up this accountant nonsense. You are going to be an academic. So yes, because of his intervention, the great legendary uh, John Saville, great, great historian. And, and that's what he did because he remembered me as a student fighting in the anti-apartheid campaign and bringing credit to my university. I was able to tell this story because many years later I returned to Hull to receive an honorary degree and to go back to your alma mater to receive an honorary degree and tell the story. And guess what? In their files, in their archives, they had records of my speeches, of my, of my students' speeches, calling for my university to rise up and fulfill its enlightenment and, and to resist the dark forces of the world. So I was able to, to address the, the, the graduating class within the context of my own history. So I would say to you that yes, you, you must stand up for what you believe is right. If young people cannot do that, if you cannot stand for what you believe is right about the world, then the world will not go forward. So if you believe that some changes must be made in your university, you stand up and demand those changes, uh, engage your vice chancellor, engage your chancellor, engage your leaders, and speak about it. I'm sure that your vice chancellor will wish to hear your views. Have that conversation. It is in the interest of the institution. This is how the world goes forward. Uh, I, myself, as vice chancellor, am also faced with challenges about the ethical nature of my institution. The question is, we have young people trapped in ghettos in Kingston, in Port of Spain, in Bridgetown. Is the University of the West Indies paying sufficient attention to the poverty around it? Are we going into the ghettos and making sure that bright young children have a chance? We're doing our best, but we're not doing enough. So when the students come to me and they say, well, listen, Vice Chancellor, we have to do more. Of course I agree with them and we find strategies. So you have an opportunity to, to have a historically transforming relationship with your vice chancellor and your university. And guess what? History has been made. You have your first female vice chancellor, right? And she'll, she'll make this place a better place for you. And then all of us, 50 years from now, when we're all alive, uh, we can look back and say, you know, as I look back on my own alma mater and said, you know, Hull is now, a, I'm very proud of my university because we stood up and changed it a little bit. It's a better place as a result. Thank you. Um, 
question here, and then I think we want uh, a chance for you all to have an, a chance to uh, talk informally with Sir Hilary. So um, we'll take one more question at the back after that, and then there's the drinks reception, if that's okay. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Um, I was very interested to um, hear what you said about identity and how um, um, the legacy of slavery affects identity. So I wanted to ask a question about um, how, your, how reparation would affect um, the identity of black Britons, because there is a population of, of um, Britons who are born and bred in Britain and are black. Yes. But um, there is a, a sort of a tension between being black and British because the general sort of uh, perception of somebody who's British is white. So I wonder, because you, talk a lot, you talked about um, reparation in terms of the West Indies, yes. and you also drew a distinction between the legacy of slavery and how it affects um, um, Caribbean, black yes. Caribbean people, and possibly how it affects black African people. Yes. But I wonder if you can comment on how reparation would affect black British people. Okay. Well, I'm very conscious of the many identities I have. I was born in Barbados uh, uh, in the Caribbean. I, I grew to maturity in this country. I was educated uh, in this country. Uh, my, my, my family lives here. My parents lived in this country 50 years. I have uh, three siblings who were born here. I, there is a, a very large Becca's tribe here. Uh, when last I checked, when last I checked, there were uh, 62 of us uh, scattered across the cities of Great Britain. And guess what? Uh, I also did a survey. Um, my family came here, uh, parents and seven children. Uh, all seven of us are university graduates. Uh, all seven of us um, came through the British system. Uh, all of my nephews and nieces who are adults are university graduates. I counted 46. The Beckles tribe is probably the most degreed black family in Britain. Uh, I have no doubt it is the most degreed family in Britain. I have a 14-year-old nephew uh, who just did 16, what do you call them, O-levels, the new version? What? He just did 16 GCSEs with 16 distinctions. And he's 14 years old. Now he's doing, the, he's doing Latin, Greek, and mathematics in A-levels, is that what they call And he probably come here. <laughs> he's probably had in here. He's a brilliant, he's a genius child. He's 14 years old. Uh, and he's a sportsman. He's going to be a part of Britain's decathlon Olympic thing going off to Rio. He's just an all-round child. So, yes, so there is that. But I have the identity of being uh, a West Indian. I have the identity of growing up in this country and feeling at home when I'm here. I feel at home in both places, so I'm a transatlantic person, uh, family on both sides, and I commute. Um, but the same conversation is taking place in Barbados. Barbados is celebrating the 50th anniversary of its independence this year. And three weeks ago, the government made a release a public information release in which it was said that Barbados is the most democratic black country in the world. And the white community went up in arms and said, how can you describe our island as a black democracy? How about us? And in the last three weeks, the newspapers are filled with outrage from the white community who feel betrayed by the concept of Barbados as a black country. And they're saying, how about us? We have been here for 200 years, 300 years. This is our home. Uh, why is your definition erasing our history and erasing our identity? We want to have that statement retracted because we are Barbadian and we are white. So the conversation is taking place on both sides. And I was asked to, to make an intervention. What really is a multiracial society? What's the, what's the culture of multiracialism? So the identity conversation is taking place not only here, but also in the Caribbean. 15% uh, of the Caribbean population classifies itself as, as white. But yet, the, the popular stereotype of the Caribbean is that there are black societies. Uh, though in many islands, blacks are in the minority. But there is that perception. 
yeah, it's like uh, when the first West Indies cricket team came to England in 1900, uh, there were two blacks on the team. There were two blacks on the team and there were 15 whites. But the British media called it a black team. <laughs> and there were only two black folks on the team. But the presence of those two black people led to a stereotype of the entire team as black. So there are interesting conversations. The reparatory justice issue would certainly contribute towards the conversation here because a critical part of reparatory justice is for the state to admit that it has a responsibility for some of this mess that has been created. And to admit that and to say, well, yes, and we will play a part towards rehabilitation and, and so on, will certainly affect the consciousness of the black community in this country that have been denied that admission for all of these years. And if you look at the history of migration, uh, yes, uh, let's say six million Africans were taken to the Caribbean. Uh, you had the 300 years of slavery and so on. Then you had another 100 years of apartheid. Uh, the apartheid followed the slavery. But in that period, there was migration. So the, the biggest project of the 19th century was the Panama Canal. And another 150,000 black people were taken from the islands and taken to Panama to build this magnificent canal. When the canal was over, then they were taken from Panama and taken to Cuba to build the sugar plantations. Uh, then after the war, Britain needs labor to help to rebuild the social services. And Britain came back and said, well, we have another job for you. You've done your Caribbean job. Now we have a job in England. Come and drive the buses and help with hospitals. So another bunch came to Britain. So the black folks have been moved from Africa around the Caribbean back to Britain, wherever labor is required, and you're being shuffled around. So that circularity of history is about capital and about power. And I think the reparatory justice issue, which confronts this history, would then say to the black community in Britain, or should say here, that you have made a tremendous contribution to this nation. And not only you, but your ancestors have made a tremendous contribution to this nation. And, and you have a right to live in this country with respect and dignity. And that is your right as a citizen. And this is the message I give my young siblings who are born here and who are British. And it hurts my heart that when, we are, when West Indies is playing England and cricket, that they support England. It, 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 breaks, <laughs> it breaks my heart that I'm here watching cricket on the telly. And my younger sisters are rooting for England over the West Indies. And I can't understand it. But this is their country. And they love their country. And they deserve the respect to be British. OK, we really want to make sure we have time to, uh, to uh, mingle in four moves, Sir Hillary. So we have time for one final pithy um, question, if that's OK. It's in two parts, and I'll make it quick. Okay. Thank you very much for the lecture that you've shared tonight. The first part of the question is, when I did black studies years ago, they talked about a seven-year turnover where people would go to the, be taken to the Caribbean as enslaved people, work for seven years, drop dead, and literally whole islands being replaced. I was wondering if you had any statistics which backed that up. And the second part of my question is, I'm nothing to do with university. What can I do to try and help reparations to, to come to pass in my lifetime? And also, is your book here? Can we buy it? Yeah. Mid <laughs> <laughs> well, if the, the, the social history research on, on the Caribbean, there's a tremendous amount of demographic research uh, on Caribbean slave uh, plantations. Uh, that speak to this horrendous demographic e experience. Uh, we have case studies of individual estates. We have studies of individual islands. There's an abundance of literature uh, on slave mortality, and morbidity, and so on. So it ought not be difficult for you to find the relevant information you need that explains why, as I said in the case of Jamaica, uh, you brought 1.3 million onto the island, and then you ended up with, with just about 300,000. Uh, Barbados, 600,000, uh, you end up with 83,000. Uh, that information is well set out in the demography and the social history of the region. Um, uh, and it speaks to uh, the fact that on our region, yes, um, uh, though it was changing over time, uh, that if, if, you got, if you got 10 years out of your enslaved person, you've done well. 
uh, one of the papers I wrote many years ago uh, entitled um, To Buy or to Breed uh, is a paper that deals precisely with this subject. Uh, every slave owner uh, was faced with that choice. Do I take my existing group of slaves and, and literally treat them better, cut their workload, improve their nutrition, uh, expose the women to prenatal, postnatal care, uh, allow the infant mortality to be suppressed? Do I put in place a package to do this, or do I just burn them up and replace them? Uh, the, the slave owners all made a very specific managerial calculation on which method was cheaper and more productive. So that by the end of the 18th century, on the whole, prior to, prior to around 1770, most slave owners in the Caribbean believe it was cheaper to, to buy than to breed, and therefore they, they took very little care of the enslaved population. Uh, the pregnant and lactating women were treated no differently from the males, and you had that horrendous demographic experience of massive infant mortality, the vast majority of women dying in childbirth and so on. So that history sets up what we call the graveyard theory, what we call the graveyard theory, where the islands became cemeteries, really. By the 1770s, the price of African slaves on the world market is skyrocketing. Uh, you could buy, when the slavery model started in the 1630s, 1640s, you could buy an enslaved African in Bridgetown uh, uh, for 20, 22 pounds. The, the Royal African Company uh, had a remit uh, in, the, in the 1670s to sell Africans in the Caribbean at 16 pounds each. Uh, occasionally there was a male-female differential uh, and so on. 16, 18 pounds was in the charter of the Royal African Company. Move forward 100 years to the 1770s, you are now paying 100 pounds, 120 pounds uh, for a male female. So you see the, inf the inflation in slave prices from the 1640s to the 1740s, 1780s. So by the end of the 18th century, most slave owners were absolutely clear that it was now cheaper to breed your own slaves than to buy from the African market. Uh, and, and thus, there is a tremendous literature uh, that emerged. Uh, the Earl of Harewood, the, the first Earl of Harewood wrote a treaty called Instruction to Managers on the Treatment of Their Slaves. And this was, he was an absentee planter, and he wrote a 15-page uh, man, management manual for his overseers. And he sets out the, the model that we now have to increase the birth rate on the estates. We have to reduce the infant mortality. We, the, tr the babies need to live. And we need to incentivize the women. And the Earl Harewood wrote a series of incentives. He said, OK, we know that the women are controlling their fertility. We don't know how they're doing it. We know they're having sex, <laughs> but they're not having babies. And we know they're doing it, so we need to unlock the women's control over their fertility. So he sets out, he says, my instruction to my managers of my estates in Jamaica, Barbados, is that for the first child that lives past three months, you give the mother five shillings. For the second child, 10 shillings. And there is a gradation of five shillings up to freedom for eight children. So the slave woman who brings eight healthy children into the world and those children live, the slave mother can now be given her freedom. So, and of course, then th those were the prenatal policies. He also sets out the postnatal policies uh, that six months into her, into her pregnancy, she ought to be taken out of the manual labor. No digging of trenches, no cutting of sugar canes, no cutting of stones, and taken out of the physical labor and allowed to lie in. And two months after she has given birth, she can lie in. So all of this is set out by the Earl of Herod in this manual to increase the slave population on his estates because the, the price of buying Africans is now horrendously high. And he succeeds. 
because on his plantation, uh, when they rolled out these prenatal policies and postnatal policies, the black population began to rise. Women began to have more and more babies. Infant mortality began to go down. And critically, he also said, the same amount of money which is given to the mother must be given to the midwife because they recognized that the midwives were critical in all of this. And the midwives were given, tr given money to make sure that the infant babies, the infant slaves live beyond the weaning period. So all of this is set out in economic manuals uh, by British slave owners. Uh, as I said, the first, the first comprehensive document was written uh, by the leading slave owners headed by the Earl of Harewood. And that document is a 20th century document. All of the issues that we know today about the manipulation of the fertility of women, the, the use of policies to intervene into the maternal relationships to society, and how packages can be offered to moderate uh, birth rates, infant mortality. The slave owners had mastered this craft in the 18th century and they wrote it down for your consideration. So it's all there for you to go and study, uh, to look at this. Uh, these were modern capitalists who understood the art of profiteering. So what can you do? Uh, the issue is you internalize your history, you, you make a commitment to your society and your institution, and you ask yourself the question, what kind of citizen do I wish to be? And become the kind of citizen that you want to be. That's what I would say to you. Well, well, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>